one of the most viral images during the initial bombardment of the Ukrainian cities was, um, it, it's strange, but you know, this is the way people operate. It wasn't of civilians killed. It was a man who took his cat with him into the bomb shelter and said, you know, here I am with my brave uh, cat. And people just connected to that story. It was a way of humanizing. We all love our pets. Um, and here's a way of seeing kind of the harm uh, the, the, that, you know, Russia is showing against civilians and the pets. So I'm Peter W. Singer. I'm a strategist at New America and author of a variety of books on uh, technology and security issues. Could you talk to me about the weaponization of social media? What does that mean? While there are computer threats to the network, which we've thought of as the idea of cyber war, we've also seen um, hacking of people on the networks by driving ideas viral through our own likes, our own shares, but but often lies. And that's the concept that we call like war, uh, the weaponization of social media. So how has the evolution of social media transformed the ways in which specifically like disinformation is spread? Essentially it's um, put it on steroids. Uh, and it's also turned all of us into not just targets, but um, fellow combatants of it. So let's, let's use an example of um, Russian uh, disinformation. Back during the Cold War, there was a project um, uh, that was called Project Infection um, with a K. And it was a KGB effort to spread the lie that the US military was secretly behind HIV AIDS. Um, it planted this story within a um, Indian newspaper that was actually a front for Soviet intelligence. The scientists quoted in it were um, East Germans posing as French scientists. That article in this um, Indian newspaper then gets reprinted in everything from Soviet press to um, extreme uh, far right and far left press in um, Europe and the United States. The overall ep operation takes um, multiple years to reach maybe hundreds of thousands of people. Compare that to today, uh, you know, a, a Russian information warrior sitting in um, Moscow can uh, plant a story in um, uh, on Twitter, uh, maybe Insta, whatever. And um, if it goes viral, it might be seen by millions within a matter of hours. And the key is that we're the ones who help drive it viral through our own, uh, you know, clicks and shares and likes. So um, essentially, it's that virality uh, that's the big difference. It comes from social networking. Uh, the other part of this, of course, is that um, we're our own worst enemy. While many of you know the stories that cause harm out there um, are ones that have been planted by authoritarian governments, the hard reality is we need to look inward, and there's just a lot of awful stuff. Uh, that's pushed, you know, within our own populations, whether it's um, extremism or false information about um, disease, pandemics, you name it. And uh, so that's, you know, that's one of the key differences is that virality is often coming from inside. It's like in the horror movies where they go, you know, oh my God, the killer's inside the house. It's kind of the same thing playing out on social networks. The key is that what happens um, online doesn't stay uh, online. It's um, like the opposite of the joke they make about Las Vegas. Uh, and, you know, what people... Um, see uh, what people read um, in online settings um, becomes part of their beliefs and becomes part of their actions. And the reason is because that's where we're drawing um, most of our news from, news about everything from um, sports to politics to disease to what our friends are up to. So if you can hack uh, that space, you can cause um, real effect on the world. Um, it's not just uh, us as individual citizens, it's also um, journalists. They did a study of journalists and found that um, over 90% of them, whether they were a um, newspaper reporter, 
a um, radio producer, um, a TV show host, over 90% were using social media to determine what stories to cover in their newspaper article, on their radio show, on TV, who to interview for those stories. And then if it was still trending, whether to um, double down and do another story, another segment. So again, if you can hack social media, you can also hack newspapers, you can hack radio, you can hack TV. And so um, various actors have seen the power of that. And the key with um, social media is, again, it can be a force for good. It can be a force for bad. Uh, the example I like to use is um, ice bucket challenge and ISIS propaganda. Ice bucket challenge, if you recall that, you know, it was a it was, I believe, a force for good, but it was very much a design campaign, you know, taking advantage of virality, people putting each other on the spot, um, people showing off for others, for the clicks, for the shares, um, to draw attention and to fundraise uh, for this disease. ISIS copied many of the very same patterns to um, induce people to join the organization, uh, to spread the virality of fear of recruiting. So again, you know, it can be a force for good or bad, but in both cases, it wasn't about just the clicks. It was that that real world effect, whether it was fundraising for disease or fundraising for terror. We can see the same thing in the um, Ukraine conflict right now. Uh, social media has been, um, of course, it's been used to, by Russia to try and spread disinformation, to try and um, undermine support for Ukraine. But Zelensky, he's been incredible at utilizing social media to draw in support for Ukraine. So again, it's 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 you know it's a it's a tool that can be used for either good or bad. When Russia invaded Ukraine earlier this year, how has Russia's approach to using social media changed and evolved since that began? One of the challenges for Russia is that, um, and this has played out, I should add, not just in the online world but in the the physical world, is um, they've been trying to fight the same war back when they were pushing against an open door to make a rhyme of it. So they were using many of the same tactics, the same approaches that they did back in 2014 against Ukraine um, to what they used in 2016 against Brexit, uh, um, the Brexit referendum. Um, they weren't against Brexit, they were for Brexit, uh, to clarify. Um, but also what they were using against um, the U.S. presidential election, et cetera. And it was a mix of um, false front accounts and trying to plant false stories had um, pretty significant effect um, in those cases that I mentioned. Uh, so as an example, in the 2014 Ukraine conflict, they were planning false stories of Ukrainian atrocities as a way of kind of muddying the water to justify their intervention. Um, now, they tried much of the same thing in um, more recent elections, uh, 2020 in the United States, uh, to they also tried it in the lead up to um, their recent invasion of Ukraine. The difference is, um, as I was saying, they were you know, pushing against an open door back then. Uh, it was everything from the platform companies themselves were basically letting them get away with anything that they wanted. Um, they had thousands upon thousands of um, bot accounts, uh, very easy to identify false front accounts. Um, during the US uh, 2016 election, for example, there was um, by one count over 60,000 bot accounts that were linked to Russia, over um, 3,000 false front accounts, um, what we call sock puppet accounts, uh, very easy to identify. A lot of that was knocked offline in the interim. The companies um, had uh, raised what they call their content moderation policy. Also, um, there, weren't, weren't as in, there wasn't as much research going on. Um, now there's researchers around the world, so not just in the companies, but you know, from universities and think tanks that are tracking this and then finally, um, the public's a little bit wiser. And so um, Russia tried a lot of the same uh, tactics, uh, trying to make the case for its invasion into Ukraine, saying, you know, first, no, it's not an invasion, and we're only responding to um, supposed atrocities. And it gets debunked. Um, it, it's uh, very clearly not effective in the same way. And... Um, 
that's really been the challenge for them. Now they've tried to move into other platforms, um, basically, you know, following where uh, the user base has gone. So, you know, back in um, 2014, 2016, a lot more um, younger people on Facebook than now. Uh, you know, TikTok would be where people are now, um, Instagram, et cetera. Um, also, you know, different places that might have uh, lower content moderation. So it's um, a little bit easier to push things out on TikTok than maybe some of the more established platforms. Um, but again, those are the primary changes that, that, you know, I've been seeing. You mentioned earlier about how, like, Ukraine has actually been quite successful in sort of combating that. Um, could you talk me through that? So there's a series of tactics, so to speak, that uh, Ukraine has utilized um, that importantly are ones that other actors um, can and are going to copy. Uh, one is the idea of pre-bunking. They didn't wait for Russia to establish the narrative that it wanted and then after the fact, try and debunk by pushing out your own facts and say, no, 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 that's not true. That doesn't tend to work. Instead, um, Ukraine and, and NATO uh, got ahead of Russia. So Russia wanted to claim this was not an invasion and that it was responding to supposed atrocities inside Ukraine um, and what the Ukrainian side, and, and this is an area that the Biden administration in the United States did very well, is in the um, weeks before the invasion, it pushed out all this evidence of Russia, you say you're not uh, going to be invading? Well, here you are massing all these tanks on the border. Here you are setting up the supply lines for it. Um, oh, uh, you say that you're responding to atrocities inside Ukraine? Here's how these atrocities that you're about to claim are false. Um, and, you know, one example was even um, the Russians tried to show off uh, supposed victims of a car bombing and um, the bodies actually uh, were very clearly cadavers that had been pulled from a morgue. So they had died before they were put inside the explosion. A different example was there was a um, emergency meeting that Putin called um, and they push out imagery of it on TV, except um, the watches of the ministers attending the meeting don't match the time. So it's hold it. You pre-taped it, which means it's not an emergency if you gathered people to pre-tape it. Um, so they pre-bumped. Then once the invasion began, they had um, a series of narratives that they pushed out that um, instead establish Ukraine's storyline. And it was everything from um, stories of, uh, you know, Ukrainian Davids fighting against the Russian Goliath. So, you know, early victories. Um, the ghost of Kiev was an example. Um, it was a supposed Ukrainian fighter pilot who becomes an ace in the opening minutes of the war. Probably not true. It's definitely true that the Ukrainian shot down Russian jets. Probably not one singular pilot who did it, but didn't matter the story of these victories goes viral. There's also stories of um, martyrs, uh, those who've been lost. Um, the story of Snake Island and the um, Ukrainian soldiers who rather than surrender, tell the Russians to go bleep themselves. That goes viral. There's story, again, there's a kernel of truth within it. They definitely tell the Russians off. Do they actually die? No, it turns out they were captured, but the impact of it is what matters. There are stories of civilian resistance. There's the um, uh, elderly woman who goes up to the uh, heavily armed Russian soldiers and tells them, um, you know, put some sunflower seeds in your pocket so that when you die, you know, flowers will grow here. Um, she just happens to be filmed uh, while she's doing that. And within a couple of hours, that goes viral and is seen by millions. Um, but the key in this is also the um, individual uh, performance, so to speak, of Zelensky himself. Rather than evacuating um, at the first sign of invasion, he stays in Kyiv, but even more so, he goes around and he's got selfies of him. You know, here he is in the streets, here he is with his soldiers. And the message is, I'm resisting too, I'm with you. And again, he's performing, so to speak, for 
two audiences. One is his own public. I'm different than other kind of leaders. I'm in the fight with you. Join me. Um, and it's incredibly effective. Uh, he has, before the invasion begins, his political party is at around 23% levels of popularity. Within a week, they're over 90%. Um, so you see this rallying effect. But it also is incredibly important in speaking to the West. And he becomes this global icon. Ukraine becomes literally the most popular cause in the world, not just of the side of the war, but in the world. And so it changes, importantly, the political dynamics in countries that range from, um, you know, in Britain and NATO to um, the U.S. to Asia. I mean, you see nations as far away as Australia and Japan sending aid to nations as um, somewhat surprising as Germany sending military aid. But importantly, you also see the um, the public side matter in um, the economic hit that Russia takes. Over 400 of the top 500 corporations in the world decide to pull out of Russia, not because of sanctions, but because it is bad for their brand to be associated with the Russian side. So again, this, this virality, this um, approach is just incredibly effective. Um, and the last thing you asked about was um, pets. This is part of a larger um, narrative uh, thread, which is really about humanizing um, the Ukrainian side, where um, rather than just posting, um, we lost this number of um, soldiers or civilians yesterday, it's personal stories. Um, it might be a personal story of a Ukrainian soldier who died, but it's um, here he is. He's a father of uh, three. He played the guitar. Click here to see him um, a video of him. Uh, he's been lost to um, one of the most viral images during the initial bombardment of the Ukrainian cities was um, it, it's strange, but, you know, this is the way people operate. It wasn't of civilians killed. It was a man who took his cat with him into the bomb shelter and said, you know, here I am with my brave uh, cat. And people just connected to that story. It was a way of humanizing. We all love our pets. Um, and here's a way of seeing kind of the harm uh, the, the, that, you know, Russia is showing against civilians and the pets. Um, and, you know, which side do you want to be on? The side that's bombing the city or the side that's taking shelter um, with other civilians and their poor pets? And again, that kind of narrative matters and it, and it's it, what's, it, it wins out. How do you think it's, things are going to play out in terms of Russia and Ukraine? And do you think that social media is still going to be playing like an integral role as part of it? Yeah, so um, in the war between Russia and Ukraine, you have um, two information uh, battlefields that, that matter greatly in um, the months and maybe even year or years ahead. One um, is actually uh, not inside the Ukrainian public, but rather in the publics in the United States and the EU. Um, is Ukraine able to keep its cause not only um, front and center so that people don't forget about it and its plight, but also um, popular, that people say, this is a side we want to be on, even at the cost of, um, you know, for example, higher gas prices or whatever else Russia tries to do during the upcoming winter. Um, the danger for Ukraine is it seems right now not losing on the physical battlefield, it's been doing pretty well there, is um, basically that publics and then therefore their politicians um, get tired of supporting them. Um, and, you know, there was major, major fears of that in the elections in the United States. But it, it, and it, if the Republican side had won with greater numbers, um, there was worries that uh, economic and military aid to Ukraine might have been limited, um, uh, but that doesn't seem to have happened. But the point is, one is the information battlefield, interest enough outside Ukraine in our public. And then the other is the information battlefield inside Russia. Um, can Putin's regime um, keep uh, 
if not the popularity of the war, but at least um, tamp down opposition against the war, you know, continue to blame whatever um, bad economy, um, continued casualties on someone else. If it is not able to do so, um, if I, the um, true losses um, I spread um, and blame attaches to the regime, then um, that is the, you know, the other major loss that would change uh, the political dynamics of the war right now, which you know, feels a little bit more kind of like stuck in a stalemate. Um, so, you know, again, it's interesting that it's the information space rather than just the battlefield that um, could determine what happens next in this war.